Good morning. My name is Ben Bengal and I'm the director of the DeKalb County Nonprofit Partnership. I want to thank you all for joining us today for this webinar on nonprofit communications. We have a few housekeeping items to cover before we get started. Um, first, we'll be recording today's webinar and the recording will be sent to you later by email along with an evaluation form so you can provide your feedback about this training. And if you'd like, you can send this uh, recording along to others in your organization who may not be attending live right now. Please note, we have everybody muted, but feel free to use the Q&A and chat features that are built into Zoom. Um, and we'll save some time at the end of today's presentation to address questions that you submit. We'll plan to have about 45 minutes of content and then around 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So with that said, um, we're really eager to get started today and we're excited to feature three presenters who many of you know uh, from our local nonprofit community. And I want to share a little bit about their background. Um, first, we have Kendall Harville, who's been with Safe Passage for uh, three years and has a background in social media management, public relations, and event planning. She loves any opportunity to be creative and is passionate about bringing the community together through social media and events. Next, we have Janine Holcomb, who's a DeKalb native and has been active on the DeKalb Chamber of Commerce and proudly DeKalb boards of directors, as well as serving on the Citizens Enhancement Commission through the city of DeKalb. She loves all things media and enjoys finding creative and sometimes weird ways to engage the Egyptian theater's audience through a wide variety of platforms. And finally, we have uh, Linnea Erickson Laskowski, who's been with Safe Passage for five years and has been involved in nonprofit government and anti-violence work for over 10 years. She's passionate about finding new, creative, and effective ways to connect our community with the nonprofits that exist to make our world a better place. So welcome to Kendall, Janine, and Linnea. Thank you so much for joining us. Awesome, thanks so much, Ben. And thank you so much to everyone for being here today and for Ben and all of DCMP for inviting us out. Um, of course, we wish we could be with you in person, but either way, we're so grateful for the opportunity to talk with you all. Um, we do have quite a bit of content, so we'll try to, try to move past the things that most everyone is probably familiar with. Um, but like Ben said, if you have questions, please jot those down, keep those in mind, and we will try to save time at the end to discuss those. Um, Linnea, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, ben already gave us a really nice introduction, but um, I am Kendall. I work with Linnea every day to um, really just get our get engagement up on our social media channels and to be honest, a lot of times we look to the Egyptian theater for some advice. We think that everything Janine does is pretty great. So um, that's us. If you do have questions, feel free to reach out to us personally or with email too. We're always happy to answer those. So um, with the pandemic, we've seen all sorts of new things happening on all of the social media platforms that we either use for our job or that we use personally. Um, we've seen things like virtual events. Um, we've see, seen agencies become very brave and try out live videos for the first time. Um, but really, mostly, we've seen our community really finding out how to be creative and how to creatively connect with the followers and their audiences. Um, um, so our goal today is to help you gain knowledge and ideas for your own platforms that you're using, um, really to build the confidence to try new things and to get creative, especially um, that's something I think we all really need right now in this mostly virtual time. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask Linnea to launch our very first poll. Um, so we're interested, what social media outlets does your agency use? And feel free to click through all of those that you have. A lot of Facebook users. Awesome. Looks like one person's on TikTok, some on YouTube. Linnea, is that you? I'm, I actually can't vote, but if oh. I could, you would have a second one on TikTok and Snapchat. <laughs> we have I'm guessing some it's on Alex there on TikTok. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, Thank for your you, participation. Alex. 
Well, it looks like most people have voted. So um, Linnea, feel free to advance the slide. Um, like I had guessed, um, I think that most of our community and most of our nonprofits are most comfortable with things like Facebook and Instagram. Um, if you were involved with the digital marketing meetup a couple of weeks ago, I believe it's been now, um, we had a lot of conversations surrounding YouTube. Um, and Janine's going to talk about that uh, in a little bit. But um, for those of you who don't know, or maybe those of you who really are on a first basis for social media, um, we know that Facebook and Instagram are pretty popular and things that um, we're most comfortable using. Um, but if you are trying to feel creative or maybe dip your toes into some other platforms, um, we think Twitter is a really great platform to connect with followers outside of our immediate community. Um, this uses really short phrases and hashtags to gain momentum or um, to gain some trends. Um, um, Snapchat is primarily used for younger audiences, um, and it allows them to share photos and videos for a maximum of just 10 seconds. Um, Pinterest is um, kind of a way to share ideas, house ideas, crafting, recipes, a whole lot of different things. Um, TikTok is something that we've really seen taken off during the pandemic. Um, also, the users are primarily a younger generation. Um, it's used to create short videos in really creative ways, and um, it often incorporates popular songs, television shows, or trending topics. Um, I just learned, and before we were jumping on this meeting, that one of the trending topics, someone was riding a skateboard with cranberry juice, listening to Fleetwood Mac, apparently. So that's a trend that you could get on if you so wish. Um, and then LinkedIn is a social media platform that really is used to connect professionals um, and to assist a lot of college-age students or, I guess, even older with, um, with job search. And I will let Janine talk about YouTube because I feel like you are definitely the professional here. Uh, I think professional is a loose term, but I appreciate it. So YouTube... I'll be honest, YouTube gave me anxieties at the start. And so here is what I think is a really great way to dip your toe into YouTube because uh, I am not a video creator. I am not, <laughs> everything I create is off my little phone. Um, so when it comes to YouTube, it can be very intimidating because you're like, I am not OC Creative or Morningstar or these great people that make content. So a great way to start um, dipping your toe into YouTube is by taking your Facebook lives or your Facebook video content that you're already creating and then place it onto YouTube. Um, to give you an example of with the Egyptian. So in March, when the world kind of totally shifted, um, we were doing these hard hat tours in person. And we obviously had to pivot the word of 2020 and went online, we went to Facebook. But what the problem was, we noticed that the demographic that was coming in person um, tended to be older and a lot of them didn't have Facebook. So it's like, okay, how can we figure out a way to obviously still bring this content uh, to our viewers, to the people who are interested in seeing what's happening at the theater, but expand upon that. So we not only obviously went live on Facebook, but then we would download that from Facebook and link it and upload it to our YouTube page. And then from there, we then embedded it, which again, I think can be a scary word because the first time I heard it, I'm like, what? Mm, you're talking code now. Um, it's quite, it can be pretty simple. Um, let me see if I can share my screen real quick. Yes, let's see my screen. Um, so here's our YouTube page. La, da, da. Uh, so you can see a lot of our content comes from Facebook. Um, but I think that's a really easy way to start, to start without getting scared. Um, but for example, let's go into 815 Live and right down here is where you can see this share. You don't have to hear me talk. You can hear me talk already. So when you have this share, it's this embed. And that's if you're, if you're using WordPress, if you're one of those people, um, as we know in nonprofits, we wear many hats in our roles. Um, so you can upload this to the website. And then when you go to the egyptiantheater.org, um, I can spell Egyptian theater. Alex, don't judge me. Um, <laughs> you can then see uh, on our page, we upload and download and put all these different things. So if you go to virtual hard hat tours, um, we then embed all of our YouTube right here. 
So that way, again, it's just expanding uh, your reach because obviously Facebook, as we've seen by the poll, majority of you have it. Um, so that gives you this great way to jump off uh, and fill up a YouTube page with content because I know it's, it's scary to launch a new platform and go, I have nothing to say or put on this. So what should I do? Um, so that is a great suggestion. Um, we had talked about earlier before we had started the broadcast, uh, if any of you guys do radio shows, uh, like with Monica in the morning, or if you have times where you're on the radio, if you have the ability to record it, I know right now it's kind of tough because you're like, well, I'm on my phone to talk to Monica. Um, but when things resemble some sense of normalcy, bring your phone and record yourself on your broadcast. Because if you put it on Facebook Live, again, you're just expanding that audience and then you can upload it to YouTube. So that's my suggestion for a really great way um, to populate. Why is this not pulling back up? It's going great, guys. It's a great way to populate your YouTube account if I can get my Zoom to come back up. No? Yeah, thanks, well, Janine. We, 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 we recently done. started, sorry, Linnea. I, I'm I've sure got it pulled up, say, Kendall. Like, yeah, so we've, that's exactly what we've um, done for our YouTube page is we've just recently started that and I can show you here. Um, we've pulled um, videos off of our Facebook. Uh, so we have um, our speaker from our fundraiser this past February, back when we could still be in person, maybe the last fundraiser that was held in DeKalb County. Um, we just, we filmed our, our speaker on a, a phone and had it on Facebook Live. Um, we were able to download that and put that up on our YouTube. Um, we've got another live video that we pulled from our Facebook that we recorded that we've got up there. And then we also have all sorts of videos that we use privately that we send out to specific audiences. So we have trainings that we've used for our staff that's up there that you have to have a specific link. So if you just search our site, you won't see this. Um, or videos that I've sent to school. So we have a variety of different ways. We don't have nearly the same amount of video that the Egyptian does, but we're starting to pull some of those older videos off of our Facebook, put them up on our YouTube so people who might be looking there can find those in a different location. Um, and things that we record in the future, now we can just put them in both places so people have more options for where they want to view that. Yeah, absolutely. And I know it might seem like you're repeating content or, well, I don't want people to see the same things, but exactly like Janine said, there's a different audience that views Facebook, that views YouTube, that visits your website and sees those embedded videos. And if they're seeing it twice, well, great. You produced a great video that people are seeing twice. So um, don't be scared to do that. And I think that's really, really great advice. Um, Linnea, feel free to advance. Awesome. So these are just screen grabs of a couple of the Egyptians platforms. Janine had just pulled up her YouTube that you see there on the right hand side. Um, but you can also see our Facebook or our um, Twitter and the Egyptians Facebook. Um, we have found most success on Facebook and Instagram. Um, locally. However, Linnea is a very, very active tweeter um, and is really great about jumping on trending topics that relate directly to our agency. Um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we have jumped in on conversations that relate directly to that, that uh, of course tie into our mission. So if you haven't looked into Twitter, I would recommend it. It does really help you reach that, um, that audience that isn't necessarily right here in DeKalb County. Um, can I jump in on that yeah, real quick? Go ahead. Um, just exactly what Kendall and Linnea have said of obviously right now 2020 is a very weird year and I think we are all being impacted um, and seeing national impact with whether you're a history center whether you're you know dealing with domestic violence whether you're in entertainment industry um, that is exactly it is you're able to tie into this network um, so like with us I'll give us as an example of the Save Our Stages Act through Neva that is a national push as a national hashtag um, so finding, it can be tough because you're like, I don't know how to communicate locally the need for Save Our Stages Act. Twitter is the great way to search and you can find people across the nation or internationally who are talking about this topic. And it's a great way to interact with that and then take that back to your Instagram or your Facebook and reconfigure that um, for a local audience. So it's a great way to do research of what's going on in your industry not just in DeKalb County. So well stated. Yeah. And I do see we have a question in the chat about Twitter. I will come back to that at the end. So just letting you know, I did see that and we will get to that at the end. 
Um, and, and I agree, Janine, um, it might feel like Twitter is a platform where, um, again, you get more of a national audience, you get, um, you know, a, less of a local feel, um, and it can feel like, well, what's the point in connecting with people who aren't in our immediate vicinity, but I've especially found that it's, it's incredibly helpful to connect to other agencies that are doing the same work. You get some really great ideas when you see some of the things that other agencies are sharing, some of the national campaigns that are going on, and it's a really great, great place to kind of see the content that's out there and see what we want to bring to our other channels where maybe we have a more local connection um, or we have we touch more local people um, so let's let's see what's going on on a national basis what campaigns what what topics what trends are happening and how can we bring them back to our local audience all right and when we think about um, what really is happening on social media, like we've all said, this is a, a unique year. Um, this is a year where we've all had to um, pivot to doing more online and hoping that we're connecting with people at the same time as I think a lot of people are tired of being online. Um, a lot of people are kind of going through the uh, doom scrolling use of social media where uh, we're, we're sitting on our couch feeling anxious about the world. So we just scroll through our Facebook or we scroll through our Instagram or we scroll through our Twitter. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people who are online, but you know, there also is this feeling of I've been on Zoom meetings all day. I don't want to get on another webinar. I don't want to uh, watch a whole uh, video. I don't want to um, engage you know, in a, in a way that requires a whole lot of effort effort from me. So we're seeing this mixed bag of our virtual events working. Are we getting more engagement on social media? But also that's really our best option for connecting with people right now. So some of the things that we're seeing that are working, uh, live videos. We know it's scary for a lot of people, but using live videos are a great way to connect with people. Um, a lot of people will get notifications from the pages they follow when an organization goes live. So it gives that additional boost to let people know, here's something you may want to watch. So that's a good way to gain more viewers because it's something that's just a little more interactive, um, but it can still be fairly short, fairly low energy, fairly low effort um, on your end and on the viewer's end. So if I pop on a live video for three minutes, that's not taking a huge amount of my time to record. It doesn't take a lot of equipment, doesn't take a lot of planning, um, and it doesn't take a lot of effort for someone else to watch that. So we've done live videos um, for Safe Passage ranging anywhere from you know, just a 30 second reminder, hey, we have an event coming up or hey, please check out this, this post, um, all the way to hour long live videos that we were doing with um, book clubs um, and other ways that people could connect with us more deeply. So um, using those live videos, being willing to just take your camera, turn that on and connect with people quickly um, is a great option. And like I said, it doesn't have to be an hour long video. It doesn't have to be scripted. It can be 30 seconds where you, um, instead of putting a picture post up, you hop on a live video and say, just a reminder, uh, the Growmobile will be in Kingston today from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, please come out and, you know, get any of your fruits and veggies. And if, you know, if you don't need any fruits and veggies, please give a $5 donation to, you know, help other people who don't have what they need. Um, you know, so instead of putting up a post, you can do a quick live video and you gain a little more attention that way, just because it's something that's a little bit different as someone scrolling through their feed. Uh, to jump on live videos real quick, Linnea, mm -hmm. um, cause like you guys said, and it is, it's very, the first time you're wanting to do a live, it is intimidating. So I suggest, um, again, to put us both all the, our organizations on the spot, find, find a buddy, find a buddy in your organization that you vibe with, like Linnea and Kendall, when you do, will you accept this rant? Uh, and with me and Alex, like we just, we have a vibe, we can joke with each other. Uh, it really does take the fear away. Uh, we've been doing live videos for three years at the theater and when we did 815 Live, Alex was like, yeah, you're gonna start it off on your own. And I was nervous. Like guys, I was very anxious. So I'm like, it's just me? It's just gonna be me talking? Oh no, man. So if you are very anxious about starting just yourself, find someone in your organization or someone in that same realm of what you do that maybe you vibe with, that you just have a good rapport with because having a buddy really does make it less scary. Um, and along with, Obviously it's engaging to see, you know, videos. It really does boost your algorithm. It appeases the Facebook gods, their rules change. I don't know what they want this week, but Facebook loves live videos and it will boost your viewership without having to put any money behind it. Um, just a quick secret inside uh, with how we operate at the theater. 
sometimes the best ideas and live videos started as a joke with us. We were like, we should do an a la Anchorman style <laughs> Facebook live promotion for Give to Cow County because I knew it would appease the Facebook lords. And we did it. It, that's, it started as a joke, but to find something that's like, oh my goodness, that could really work. And I know someone in my organization who could help me pull this off. Um, so that way you can find ways that you can ease into something that is very intimidating. Mm-hmm. One last thing I want to jump into. Um, our Will You Accept This rant also started as a joke. Linnea I loves just- The Bachelor. She was like, you should watch it. We could totally talk about it at Safe Passage. And I was like, okay, sure. We'll talk about this trashy reality TV show on Facebook Live. And it has been very, very popular. But one thing I was going to say in regards to live videos was a piece of advice that Janine gave us at a digital marketing meetup or something. But um, it is a little intimidating to go live for the first time. And if you mess up, no big deal. People like to see that you're a real person too, because so many people who do follow us on social media haven't actually met us in person. So when we're acting like real people, having these conversations, joking around and even stumbling over our words, I think that's okay. So don't fault yourself if that happens. Yeah, absolutely. I I think the, the secret sauce is I've always wanted to, you know, every show, our marketing strategies change so drastically with every type of show of who we're trying to reach, what we're trying to talk about. But the overall consensus is I want us to seem fun. Um, So they must assume, oh, anyone, any show they have there must be fun. And same like seeing Kendall and Linnea, like they're caring. They're clearly genuine caring people. So I know I could reach out to Zay Passage and I can see two people who I already know their face, I already know their demeanor, and I know I can trust them. So it's that type of interpersonal without having the personal because you're talking to a screen. But really, like Kendall said, letting people get to know you, letting people see you, you know, be awkward and maybe stumbly on your words. Our rule at the theater is like, well, we didn't offend anyone. We're not like swearing as long as you're just genuine and kind and sticking to your missions point, people are going to be very forgiving of, oh, they stumbled on this word. No, no one's really going to care. I think people are going to see you as humans and warm up to you more because of that. Right. And I don't, I think don't be afraid to be personable. Um, I think a lot of times we have, maybe we have a more serious mission or we have a more professional organization and we feel like that means we can't be fun. You know, at Safe Passage, we're a domestic violence and sexual assault crisis center. That is not a fun organization. We're not tails with cute puppies or the Egyptian with fun shows. We don't have that angle, but that doesn't mean that we have to be serious and depressing 100% of the time. Um, you know, our, I think our goal for almost every organization, for almost every nonprofit is we want to make the world a better place. We want to make people's lives better. And part of that is joy and happiness and fun. Um, ideally, in a world where our clients wouldn't have to struggle with domestic violence, they would be having more fun. They would be having more joy in their lives. Um, so I don't think we want to a- avoid that. Of course, you want to make sure that you're being respectful. You're not treating topics lightly that shouldn't be treated lightly, but that doesn't mean that you can't Um, you know, bring a fun spin to a topic or talk about something, you know, poverty and hunger are not fun topics, but fruits and vegetables are awesome. (laughs) You know, have a cute video of a kid trying, you know, Brussels sprouts for the first time, or, um, you know, have a rainbow of fruits and vegetables showing how cool the, you know, the rainbow is. Um, I think there's ways to to, to bring a, a levity to even serious topics in appropriate ways by using different, um, different, different tone, um, different voices and different times, of course, just to, to, to switch things up a little bit, because if you are operating in that mode of doom and gloom or, uh, or where our budget shortfall or, um, people are suffering all the time, it, it's hard to remember that, well, we're really working with people, people who want, you know, to have fun and to have joy and to have happiness. And, and we want to bring that too. So don't be afraid um, to not be super serious all the time. Like Kendall said, if you make a mistake, that's part of what makes you a person and makes people feel more comfortable. 
Um, just briefly, a couple more recommendations. Stories are a great place if you have content that maybe isn't as directly connected to your mission or something that you don't want to be in your feed, but something that you really want people to get. You can put up a post on an Instagram story or on a Facebook story. On Instagram, you can even save those posts at the top of your profile um, in your highlight reels. So they will still be there for someone who wants to look back, but it's not going to be in your feed. So um, when there have been... Um, social justice issues that have not been directly connected to, um, you know, on the ground DeKalb County safe passage work. Uh, maybe it's something about voting. That's not, you know, Safe Passage is not a voting or rights organization. We're not the League of Women Voters, but voting is very important for our clients for making sure that we get the funding that we need to make sure the laws are passed that we need. Voting is critical for us. So maybe we would have Instagram stories about voting. Maybe we'd save those in a highlight reel at the top of our profile. Use that for content that you maybe don't want in your main feed um, or stuff that you're going to post more often um, and keep that in your stories. Um, don't be afraid if you're looking for content for Facebook Live and you want to have that conversation, um, like we've talked about, use Zoom. You can um, go live on Facebook from a Zoom account. Um, so you want to have a conversation with someone, but we can't be next to each other right now. Get on a Zoom call together and um, promote that or uh, go live on, on Facebook from your Zoom account. That's an option. If you'd like more information on how to do that, we'd be happy to walk you through that. Um, so we'll give you our emails at the end. You can definitely let us know if you'd be interested in learning how that works. And then like we've talked about already, YouTube. Put your content up on YouTube too, um, especially if you're a youth serving organization or your demographics, you're looking to engage more younger people. Um, I have been asking middle and high school students and college students what social media platforms they use and almost across the board, 100% use YouTube. So get your content up on YouTube as well. It's just one more place where people could find that. And it doesn't take any more effort for you to just put it in multiple places. You're not recording new videos. You're just putting that content in multiple places for people to find it. And then, like I said, really think about finding your voice. Um, think about where, where you can find those moments of, of levity or joy that you can post, where you need to be more serious, um, who you're talking to. And like Janine said, every marketing strategy is different. Who are we trying to engage? What are we trying to accomplish? And what do we need to do to make that happen? So a few of the more popular platforms and kind of what we see, how we use them at Safe Passage, um, for Facebook, we know that that tends to be more of a place where people are going for information. You're looking for updates on your, you know, your old high school classmates. You're looking for updates on your grandkids. You're looking for, uh, you know, what's going on in my community this week, events, information. So that's really a more informative place. You can put more information online on your Facebook page. The demographics for that audience tends to skew older. There are not many college students and younger who are using Facebook anymore. Um, so that is going to be where you might find more of your donors. That might be where you find more of your community, people who are connected in your community, um, you know, your alder representatives, your uh, counselors, your uh, other nonprofits, you're going to be connecting with those kind of people on Facebook. Um, it can be a little bit more longer form. We almost always recommend that you use photos or graphics. If your post is just text, it's going to get lost in that algorithm. So do a video, put a, um, put a picture, some graphic with everything you post, um, just to make sure that that is being seen. If you need something to come up with some of those graphics, Canva is a really great free tool that we would recommend for that. Facebook also tends to have a more formal feel. Um, people connect personally in a more informal way on Facebook, but from an organization, we tend to see that most people expect a more formal, um, a more serious um, kind of engagement on Facebook. Instagram, on the other hand, is completely photo or graphic driven. You're never going to put up just straight text on Instagram. You always, that's where you're putting your photo content. Um, you can share the same things between Instagram and Facebook or the same graphics between Instagram and Facebook, but Instagram is where people are going to want to see that really, that really beautiful picture uh, that you took as, you know, you were in a staff meeting this morning, um, that, you know, picture of a flower that's growing in your sidewalk outside your organization. Put that post up there, uh, not quite as long form. That's going to be more of a mid-range post or more of a short post. It can be a little bit more informal, a little bit more fun. That might be where you put up some of those behind the scenes photos of, oh, we are filming a video for Facebook today. This is a picture of us as we're trying to get the camera angle right. You now put some of that fun stuff up on Instagram. We talked a little bit about the stories. You can put that information there. Um, and we tend to see that this tends to be uh, younger folks and also, um, you know, uh, kind of younger through maybe 
Gen X are, are pretty consistently on Instagram. Um, so it skews a little bit younger, but still not quite nearly as young as the Snapchat and the TikTok. Um, and then Twitter is another one. Again, Kendall talked a lot about how we use this. We use this to connect on trending topics. We use this to connect nationally. This is a very informal channel. It's a great place to be exposed to uh, voices of people who may not be represented in your organization. So we're learning from national experts when we're on Twitter. There are people who are putting incredible content out there. We're learning from national experts on uh, on domestic violence and sexual assault. We're learning from um, organizations that focus specifically on how domestic violence and sexual assault uh, affect black trans women. We can get voices that talk specifically about how um, economics and domestic violence intersect. Um, you can find really important topics that you can educate yourself on. And then again, see what do we need to bring back maybe for our Facebook audience or our Instagram audience from here. So hop on those trending topics with, with Twitter, um, look for what's going on in the world. So if we see that um, there was just a major news story that broke and it connects to our agency, you might want to send a tweet about that. All right, and then I'm going to let Janine talk a little bit about what kind of equipment can help you get to the post that we need. Sweet. So um, when we started at the Egyptian going live, it was literally just a smartphone. Um, but you can expand that upon as much as you want. So if I can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so you by no means, I don't want you to see this and be like, I need all of this equipment to do the things. You don't. Um, you can start small. Um, I've created a link in here. So everything we're going through with any live stream um, is starting with a phone. It's starting with a smartphone. This little baby has become the key <laughs> to 2020 and broadcasting all of our content. Um, but you can make some pretty gosh darn official looking content straight from your phone with some of these basic equipment pieces. Um, a tripod, you could get a little tripod that'll fit an iPhone. You can attach it to a full-size camera tripod, a little tripod. You can get those for super cheap on Amazon. Um, and that can take, I have a little one that looks like a little spider. It grabs onto things. I take that to radio stations. I have it in my car. Um, so that way in the before times, uh, when I was actually going to, you know, WDKB to do an interview with Monica, I'd have that thing set up in the corner and they know I'd come in with my little tripod and I have two audiences then for the price of one. I had to schedule one meeting, one time to talk and a tripod, just that little investment gets me now to multiple audiences. Um, a gimbal. So that's the little stick, technical terms, I'm very techie. You attach your phone to it and basically then when you walk around, it keeps your phone stabilized. Um, that's fantastic. That was a game changer when it came to Give to Cal County for us, uh, when it came to, if any of you watched 815 Live. Um, you can make some pretty fancy shots. Yeah, if you wanna click on the Egyptian theater equipment for me, Linnea, and run through, you can actually see visually what it looks like. And I've included links on Amazon. Now, don't freak out. Some of like a gimbal is more of an investment. That's more of like a, you know, you're looking at potentially a couple hundred bucks. So you don't have to start with that. And it depends on what your content is. So here we've got our lavalier mics at Smart Lab. That was our first investment in going live. Um, when we started doing interviews, when you have one phone and say you're interviewing two people and it's going to be on the roof of the Egyptian theater as one does. We wanted to find a way to make it, okay, we're taking the time to literally climb up to the roof and put in, bring content to our audience. We better make sure they can hear us. So this investment of, you know, that lavalier mic that you can just attach and then right below it is a splitter. So you can have two mics going at the same time into one phone. Um, and then right below it is the extender. So you're like, hey, we don't wanna stand so close, we wanna extend this. These were really small. These were our first investments into going live. Now, started from the bottom, now we're here. That's our mic packs currently. So we do have Bluetooth wireless mic packs. Um, we invested in those this year when we knew we were gonna to have to go live a lot because we had to change everything. Obviously 2020 has changed everything for everyone. So with our, um, virtual hard hat tours, we always had a mic pack on. So you can have two, we have two mic packs. So I'd wear one, Alex wears one, and then Brandon, who's usually filming, he has the main hub that's connected into the phone. 
Again, you do not have to start there. That was three years into really getting comfortable with live streams. Um, that's the next investment. Further down, you see my little, that's my spider. I love him. It's the greatest. And you can take off that little top nib that holds your phone and you can attach that. I have a camera tripod from my mom from like 1985. It attaches, perfect. So if you have one of those tripods at home, you can use that little nibbin that holds a smartphone and attach it to a full-size tripod. So that's what we did again with 815 Live. We had two old, old tripods that had those little nubs holding our phones in place. So again, it looks like you have nice two static shots that are really fancy and really it's just two phones. And then the farther down is our little gimbal stick. So that's what we use to walk around. So say you're wanting to do a tour of, you know, a new exhibit you have going on and you want to really walk an audience through something, but you don't want to be bouncing the whole time. This is a really great investment. It makes some really basic shots look super slick and super sexy. And like you invested a lot of money and really you're like, nope, I was just walking along. Um, another way, this is so like, again, secrets. We filmed all this B-roll for our capital campaign video, and we wanted a low shot of the seats, of just like this nice panning shot. Uh, it was me in our wheelchair, holding my phone to the ground with Brandon pushing me behind. So it could be an office chair. If you're starting to think of like, hey, I'm just trying to be creative, think outside the box of how can I get a shot uh, that looks how I want it to look. Um, without maybe having to make that investment right off the bat. So I know but money is super tight, obviously, in 2020. Um, and the way you can take that gimbal even to the next level with 815 Live, I've been plugging that the whole time because that's our most recent broadcast. We really wanted to have an audience watch a show, you know, watch a live musician for an hour, but we didn't want to just have a static shot. So with the gimbal, you have your walking around, but to make it look like we had a crane on stage, which we by no means did, it's me climbing up a ladder holding the gimbal stick. So it just looks like this gorgeous crane shot when really it's Alex in my ear being like, go up the ladder. It's going to be a beautiful shot. So think of all these different things you may have around your organization that honestly tricks your audience into thinking you put all of this really extra effort when really it's just thinking outside the box and finding those people in your organization because by no means, I don't think between me, Kendall, or Linnea are one of us sitting here going, yes, I am the only one who's thought of these ideas. Not the case. Having those people that you trust in your organization to maybe be like, what if we did this? Those are the ideas that sometimes turn out into brilliance. And finally, that's a little loom cube at the bottom. It's about this big. Um, it's a lighting cube. It's great. Uh, we used it again during 815 Live to just so say you're in a dark space, you're in some place that just doesn't have the best lighting uh, and you don't want to look ghostly, <laughs> you can invest in something like that as well. So those are some rundowns of the basics um, of what you can invest in that really is all centered around this little bad boy and it can make your uh, production value, it, tr it, can, it tricks people into thinking that you spent a lot of time and money into something when really once you get a vibe and a feel for how it's going, you can really make it so it fits the needs of your organization. So now, what to post? That is the million dollar question. Um, I'll let, is it, I think we're all kind of tag teaming on this one about what to talk about, how to post, who, what, what you should be engaging your audience with, and that can differ widely. Yeah, I think my best advice um, is to steal things. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's no point in reinventing the wheel. If you see that another organization has had a great idea, use it. Um, <laughs> uh, if it's someone in your community, maybe credit them. Say, hey, we saw that the yes. Egyptian did this and we loved it. So we're doing it too. If it's not locally, I don't think, I don't think any other nonprofit cares. If, if they, you saw that they had a great idea and you thought, I want to do that too. Maybe, you know, if you want to, if you want to reach out to someone, I've never had someone tell me, no, I've never had anyone be um, upset when we've um, used a concept that someone else had, but so follow other agencies that do the same work you do on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, see what they're doing and say, I love that. Let's do that too. So steal ideas. That's my best advice. Find yeah. what someone else is already doing that works great and do it yourself. Yes. Yeah, absolute think, virtual creep. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think um, a lot of ideas for our content, specifically for Facebook, come from those teachable moments. Right now, if you've um, looked on our Facebook at all, we've mostly been sharing all educational pieces about domestic violence because it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, so jump on those like more of trending months like, oh, this month is, you know, whatever, something that relates to your agency. See if you can incorporate that on your social media. Um, and then of course, we always use our Facebook and our other social media channels to talk about the events or the live video series that we do have going on. Mm -hmm. and, and the things you might think are the most mundane will get the most likes. I, I still talk about it with bitterness. <laughs> you cultivate this content stream of what you have. And then one time we were changing the light bulbs in the chandelier and that had the most likes of the summer. Oh, you think I planned it out so perfectly. And then you take a snapshot and you're like, of course, Alex blew up. Good for you. So those things that to your organization might be like, no one cares. They do. They want to see behind the mm -hmm. scenes so bad. Yeah. And go yeah, and going along with that, sorry Linnea, just really quickly. I was going to say um I think so often people see Linnea and I on our social media and they see Janine and Al they basically see all of your staff, Janine, but sure. I was going to say safe it. passage, we have we have a large staff that we don't necessarily always see on Facebook. I'm sure if people look at our Facebook they think, "Oh, safe passage is Kendall and Linnea," but really we have all of these other staff members that we like to share through staff anniversaries or um, different different ideas like that. When we do have volunteers and interns, we share pictures of them and their trainings or different things that they're doing to help out our agency because, you know, it really, it takes all of us to make our agency run and to support our mission. Yeah. Introduce your staff. Let Give them a, a platform. Put up a picture of a staff member. Have them share why they love working at your organization. Do that once a week. Um, share those staff. Every time you get a new intern, have an introduction post for them. Maybe if you have some really consistent supporters or volunteers, share them as well. Give donors a chance to share why they donate to your agency. That's huge for them to be able to share that message so other people might be inspired as well. Um, and when you think of events, of course, that's your fundraisers. You want to share photos. You want to give people a, a picture of what's coming or what's happened. But also think of things like um, our staff carved pumpkins yesterday. So we're putting pictures up about that. Or um, our interns got together for a training. So we're putting up a picture of that. Brag about your organization and what you do as well. So what you do for your clients, but also what your staff are doing too. You know, if you have an all staff training, take a picture of that and say, look, we're learning um, about DCFS mandated reporting and our job uh, as mandated reporters. And isn't it so great that our staff are so trained and so, um, so professional or um, we're out at, you know, a community table event, always put a picture of that up there, get that content out. So big and small events, make sure you're getting at least a picture, maybe a live video, maybe a photo series, um, get that stuff together and, and make sure that you're sharing that as much as you can. Real quick, I know we're up against the deadline, um, but I will show you the method of madness that I use. And I'm gonna share this with everyone, um, my social media madness. So you can see, like I'll give you October. This is how I lay out and I can tell you like I'm doing a mission-based post. So I can know this is about our mission. This is about the booze and spirits event. This is a national issue about save our stages. So I'll share this with y'all um, with everyone at the end, but you can see then, oh, I don't wanna be posting event, 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 event. And have people be like, we get it. <laughs> Trying to like diversify uh, your social media strategy. So I'll share this with everyone. Um, but just wanted to give a quick insider peek of like how the madness works within, because once you have that kind of way to navigate your content, it will just come and fall into place. Right. Absolutely. And, and you do bring up a good point that keeps you from putting just one type of content out there. Right. Where they're um, like, we get it. <laughs> that's really easy, especially when you're a small nonprofit to feel like, I don't know what to post. So just like once a week, something happens and I post about it. Um, try to be, you know, try to plan ahead, try to have those things in place. So you, you know, like, okay, I'm, I'm pulling a national issue in and I'm posting about that today. I'm going to do a throwback picture today. I'm going to do this today. So that just gives you kind of a plan. So you're not in the lurch thinking, well, what can I post? I'm a volunteer. Absolutely. 
I don't know what's going on with our nonprofit today. I'm not, you know, a full-time staff. I don't know what to post. Give yourself a plan. So that's definitely a great idea. And uh, like Janine said, we're kind of up against the, t the clock for leaving you time for questions, but we just do, um, if we can just leave you with this question to think about, what kind of content could your organization make? And maybe take um, just a minute or two, if you want to share in the chat, if there's anything that you've thought of, of something that you've been inspired of, oh, we could do a live video about this, or we could put, put some posts up on Instagram about this. What, what kind of content could your organization be sharing out right now? Like I said, light bulbs get likes. I think that's the takeaway. <laughs> behind, don't underestimate, behind, don't behind, underestimate the behind the scenes. And we do have a number of questions that have come in. Yeah, we can just go um, ahead and dive into those. <clears throat> yeah, let's do that. Um, and in the chat, there's been a lot of talk about Canva. So if you haven't been keeping an eye on the on the chat, um, take a look at that. Um, but want to get to some of these questions. So um, one of them says, uh, you referenced it earlier, Linnea, gaining traction um, on Twitter requires a lot of tweets daily. Is that correct? I've heard 10 times a day. Um, can you respond to that? The more consistent you are on any social media platform, the more an algorithm is going to boost your page to be seen more frequently. But I find with Twitter, it's less about how much you post and more about what you're posting. So what content you are connecting to. So um, if I just put a post out there that just says, Safe Passage thinks that domestic violence is wrong, nobody's going to see it. I'll get maybe 60 or 100 views in a month. But if I uh, use a hashtag that's trending, so like Kendall said, this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. If I say Safe Passage thinks that domestic violence is wrong, hashtag Domestic Violence Awareness Month 2020, I'm going to get more views because that's a trending hashtag or that's a hashtag that is being used this month. So other people are searching for that. They're going to see my post. And then if they retweet it, that gets me more views and more views. Or if I see a, a post that's popular, something that's showing up in my news feed or in my Twitter feed, and I retweet that with a quote, um, if I see someone else says that domestic violence is bad and I retweet it and I say, safe passage agrees, hashtag domestic violence awareness month, we're going to get more views from that. So look at what's trending. Um, Twitter will show you what's trending in your area right now. You can look for what's trending nationally. If there's a news story that's going on, share posts about that. Use the hashtags that are popular. That's what's going to get you views on Twitter more even than posting consistently is just using whatever is trending right now or uh, retweeting um, trending topics, trending news topics. And I would say if you're retweeting something, which means you're sharing a tweet that someone else wrote, always add your own thoughts on it. So you retweet with a quote. That's what's going to get you views on to your page. Instead of just retweeting theirs, you always want to add your thoughts. Even if you just add a hashtag, always make sure you're retweeting with, with your own um, wording on there. And there's some good back and forth going on in the chat. So um, check that out for some other ideas. Um, our next question is, uh, do you segment your audiences? So what ideas do you have for providing the best content to our various audience segments? So this might go beyond social media and, and talking about your more your communications more broadly. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, we segment our audience almost every weekend when we have shows uh, because our audience changes. Uh, someone who's coming to see It's a Wonderful Life might not be coming to see a Fleetwood Mac tribute. So yeah, finding ways you can do that within Facebook, if you're wanting to stay on social media, you can target people without having to boost it saying, I want this to go to people over 45 who live within a 50 mile radius who are interested in Fleetwood Mac. Um, absolutely. To segment your audience is huge. Um, I shared, I think with Ben a while ago when we had, we had an audience that was majority Spanish speaking. So you could make a dark post. So we put a post in Spanish, but we were like, well, this doesn't really fit with the rest of our social media. They're gonna be like, the Egyptians lost their way. What are they doing? So we were able to do it as a dark post to a very segmented audience of, we're looking for people who are Spanish speaking, interested in Latin music, interested in John Cicada. So we were able to still put something out there without any money behind it and making it a very, very specific audience. So you can absolutely, if you're looking for people who are into philanthropy, who are into gardening, who are into whatever it is that your organization and you're wanting to target those people, you can absolutely do that um, 
with boosting makes it very clear of when you're boosting a post, it really walks you through that, but you can do it without boosting as well. Kendall or Linnea, do you want to respond about segmenting? We probably don't segment our posts um, that much. We prop we segment more by our platform. Um, so the posts that we put on Facebook versus the posts we put on Instagram versus the posts we put on Twitter versus what we send out in, in an email mailer, it's all ten tailored a little bit towards a different audience. So um, we try to keep our voice consistent by platform, but we are not Maybe we're not quite as um, adept as the Egyptian about segmenting our audience and so much of our audience overlaps that we, we tend to more segment by platform rather than by, by audience within a platform. Mm. Jackie brought up a question in the chat. Does anyone post in Spanish and English? Um, do you do separate posts for each language? We have not um, posted in Spanish and English. We primarily do just um, just post in English, but our website, um, which we link to a lot, has a button at the end of the page, which most um, bilingual people are familiar with, and they can um, they can transfer our whole entire website into their um, their language. So that's what we do um maybe we should be better about that doing um, more of the dark posting but we know the more majority of people who do um really interact with us on social media um are able to find that website as well yeah i think that's an accessibility issue for sure and if we mm -hmm. had um if we had the ability to do so that would be really helpful um, I, what I tend to see most when I'm seeing other agencies, and this is what I see uh, uh, the community gardens doing, is putting both in one post. Mm -hmm. um, I would be cautious about always putting English first and then Spanish second, um, just as that kind of gives a feeling of prioritization. But, um, you know, thinking about if, if you can, if you have that ability, absolutely translate. If you know that you have a target population for your organization that speaks a certain, that speaks a certain language commonly, whether that's Spanish or something else, um, having materials in that language is always an important accessibility issue. Mm -hmm. um, so especially for uh, human service nonprofits, I, if you can do that, that's awesome. Um, another thing I will say for accessibility is if you have um, and we are, we're not good at this. It's always in the back of my head that we need to be better about this, um, but about putting descriptions on all of your posts for, especially for, for visual posts. So um, if you post, if you share a picture, having um, writing in the, uh, in the text of um, visual of a flower in front of a sunset with a hand holding the flower uh, and the words saying have hope you know describing what that visual image is so someone who's using a screen reader is able to see what visual you put with your your worded post so some of those accessibility things are not things that we automatically think of but are really important for social media as we try to expand our accessibility and that could be a whole nother post of accessibility on social media but uh, i will say we we are aware of our need to improve that um, we don't we haven't done a whole lot of that yet. Mm -hmm. I have a really interesting question here. Um, with COVID and the news cycle the way it is, um, sometimes our planned content can seem out of touch or not of the moment, quote unquote. Um, how do you deal with that? We want to work ahead and schedule our content, but sometimes that can backfire. Yeah. yeah um, that's a very good point. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> you have to have some flexibility because yeah, if there's a major news story that break, you know, if the if the front headline is two hundred thousand people dead from COVID and we've got a funny post scheduled about um cold and flu season, like that's just not gonna land. Um right. <laughs> uh so scheduling is important, but being able to get in there and and change a post. Um, or add something, you know, usually what it means uh, isn't that like what we're planning to share is bad. There, there's some times where something just might feel just really, oh, okay, with what's going on, this just is, feels tacky to post this right now that you'll need to reschedule. Um, but often it's just that we also need to talk about this. So we've got a couple posts scheduled for Facebook today. Maybe we should add one more on the fly about this topic that's, that's trending right now or this topic that everybody's talking about. So if you are scheduling, make sure you have someone who knows how to get in there and shift things around as things change because oh buddy, it's exhausting to try to keep up with everything that's going on in the world. And we want to make sure that we're not falling behind. Mm -hmm. Well, and to have someone like Linnea said, um, I know I can't remember the example, but I know there was one time where Alex was like, we don't have any posts going out about this, right? This seems like a bad idea. And so to have that content calendar that you can quickly pull up, someone that you know in your organization will call you out and be like, you're, you're taking care of this, right? It, 
definitely helps because like Linnea said, you can get lost in kind of the world of, oh, I got that scheduled two weeks ago. I completely forgot about it. So having that type of spreadsheet or something that you can just weekly check in on and then you go, oh, I know I have a post coming up about this. It might seem a little tone deaf now. So let's reschedule that. Let's push that back. Um, so just being aware of what you have scheduled and visiting it weekly. So you're really, um, you know, your content back and forth. Mm -hmm. Another tricky question here, uh, when talking generally about nonprofits, I've heard a donor comment, if they have that much time to spend on Facebook, they don't need our donation. Uh, what's your response to that? Um, and this may be an instance of a, a, a donor that was um, maybe just being flip or something like that, but maybe there's a real concern there. So just wondering uh, uh, if you have a reaction to that. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, at Safe Passage, we are pretty fortunate to have staff. I mean, the majority of my job is social media and events. Um, and we know a lot of nonprofits don't have one or two specific people to focus on social media. Um, and maybe that's what the donor was referring to. If this organization who doesn't have a specific staff member um, dedicated to that, then what are their other staff members doing? Um, but I think that statement or that question really does come from um, a lack of understanding. Because as we move into this kind of new way of marketing, we know that it is so important to be engaged with people on social media. Um, we know that we've we've had donors reach out to us and give a donation to us on Give to Cal County because of the things that we do on our social media channels. So I do think it is really important, and I think that there just needs to be more education surrounding social media usage um, in relation to um, donations and donors as well. Well, and I think. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, this is where people are. You know, if we want to connect with people, this is where they are. So just like having, you know, just like having a good newsletter, just like having a good email, uh, you know, outreach, social media outreach is how we reach people now. And it's, it's new and it's different. And that can, um, that can be an adjustment for people to get used to the idea that this new media is here to stay, but it is how we talk to people. And even things like that might not seem relevant for our organization like TikTok. Well, if you want to talk to middle schoolers or you want to talk to high schoolers, they're not on Facebook, you know? So we have to meet people where they are depending on your audience. And there is always going to be a level of social media. And I don't know about other people, but you know, depending on which platform you're using, you can often toggle between your personal platform, your personal account and your, your work account on one social media app, which can get dangerous. Be cautious if you're doing that. But that means that when I'm at home and I'm scrolling through Twitter and I see something that is, is trending at eight o'clock at night on a Friday night, guess what? I'm hopping onto my work Twitter and I'm tweeting about it from there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something that if you have someone who's dedicated to having a good social media platform, they're probably doing it on their own time too to support your agency. So, you know, it, it really is one of those, it's new and it's different, but it is, uh, it really is a benefit to your agency to be able to communicate in this way. It's a cost savings really. And, and to know your metrics, to really know what your Facebook is doing. I could sit there and if a donor said that to me, I would say in 2017, the Egyptian theater raised $4,000 through Give to Cub County. In 2018, we raised 13,000. What was the difference? Facebook. That's a huge metric. That is something that is black and white on paper. It is what it is. Facebook made the difference. And so to be able to sit here and say, we've increased from 35,000 patrons a year to 42,000 patrons a year in three years. And our Facebook has grown tremendously because of that. There's a correlation. So to know your metrics, to have to, every month, I have to give a board report to my board of directors to basically say, here's why my job's important. And one of the major keys is social media. And to sit here and say, this is growing our audience base. This is growing people buying tickets. This is growing people who care. And so to have that type of, you know, that type of information off the top of your head, because you will, you will get naysayers will be like, well, TikTok, that's like not a thing. And you're like, it's, it might not be for your audience, but if it is, know your metrics, know what it's done for your organization. And that alone is your argument. Well, we've come up to our, our time. This is really great content. I think we could keep going. Um, but I want to do a quick lightning round of um, what's your main takeaway that you want the audience to know. And if we could just go one by one, you know, if you come away with one thing, what is that? And I know, Linnea, you have another poll as well. Yep, I've just got that poll up there in case there's anything else that you might want us to talk about in the future. Uh, we'll have a poll there for that as well.
Yeah, yeah thanks. Could, could we start with Janine and just that, that big picture, one takeaway for the group? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of Facebook. Don't be afraid of live streaming. Um, it's weird. It's going to feel awkward. Find your buddy in your organization, and it's okay if it's not perfect. People aren't perfect, and people aren't expecting you to be perfect. So jump in with two feet and rip that band aid off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, um, in when we become creative, we do have that kind of weird period where it's like, will this work? Will it will it not work so well? So just like Janine said, don't be afraid, rip the bandaid off, get right in there and do it because we know that all of these nonprofits in our community are so great and we all have so much to share. So, so get on there and do it. There's nothing to be scared of. And I think my takeaway would be look at what other people are doing, see what works well for other people and copy it. Don't be afraid. And, you know, of course, plagiarism is bad in certain circumstances, but when it comes to nonprofits, just steal other people's ideas and run with them. Cause if it works great, that's what we all want for each other. So look at what, what's working well for someone else um, and try to do something similar. Yeah. I think steal and give credit. I mean, yes. that's <laughs> yeah. a great way to lift way to up another it. partner organization and Absolutely. You know, say, Hey, Egyptian theater is doing an awesome job on this. Here's our version. Um, you know, so, so great ideas in all of this. And I really, I so appreciate the content that you've all shared. Um, is the poll showing at this point? Yes. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me okay. end that and put that up for everyone. So Tracking cool. followers. we can yeah. see uh, a few people for Twitter, uh, not for, not much enthusiasm for Twitter. <laughs> uh, videos, <laughs> boosting or ads, uh, tracking followers. And then someone in the comments, understanding an those analytics, um, in constant contact. Oh, uh, we see a comment. There's constant contact. Social media integration will work with Twitter scheduling for anyone who's looking to schedule tweets. So, um, social media analytics, tracking followers. That sounds like those are some big needs out there. Yep. And we've got some ideas for the future. Well, thank you so much. This is a really valuable content. We really appreciate um, your time. And um, more broadly, we really appreciate everybody who joined us today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending a follow-up evaluation, and that's going to be uh, coming to your inbox um, in the next day or so. And we'll also include the recording and the slide deck. Um, so in closing, we want to encourage everybody to visit dcmp.org, follow us on Facebook uh, for upcoming trainings and opportunities or to sign up for our newsletter. Um, just want to make sure you're aware you're not going to want to miss our next webinar. It's on November 5th, where we'll hear from Kristen Miller of the NIU Foundation and Terry Sparts of the DeKalb County Community Foundation. And they're going to be presenting a, a webinar uh, titled Doubling Down on Donor Stewardship. And so we know fundraising is on everybody's minds these days, and we uh, hope that you'll join us for that timely and relevant webinar next month. You can learn more about that on our website and register for that today. So once again, um, thank you for attending, and a big thank you goes to Kendall, Janine, and Linnea for sharing their time and expertise with all of us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye, friends. Bye.